I'm Dr. G, and for the past 10 years of my life, I've been passionate about all things holistic healing. I've been committed to healing myself and others from the inside out by incorporating some of the most effective modalities for healing the mental, the emotional, and the physical. I've learned that they give us the opportunity to be our most authentic and powerful selves. Heal Thyself is a show dedicated to just that. Today's show is going to be incredible, and I say it every week, of course I do, because it is incredible. Knowledge bombs of digestible information to empower and create clarity on what the highest version of us looks like. Product reviews to provide informed consent so you can buy the safest and best products out there. Better than the first two that I spoke about, and you're getting other B vitamins, which are energizing, right? Get off of it, throw it away. And special guest segments with some of the brightest and most elite minds in their field. So what is that like on my nervous system? Six hours of holding that emotion. Here's the earth, here's the mechanisms and mechanics of an earth when it breathes. We would think much different about that asthma patient that shows up. All to create change in all the parts that make you, you, so we can start healing ourselves and each other. All right, everyone, today's special guest, man, I've been trying to get this guy on here for more than a year. You know, we had all of the uh, obstacles that COVID presented, but all the way from Australia. I don't know if he's ever going to get back there, but Simon Hill has a master in nutrition, and he is one of the leading voices, period, when it comes to eating a whole food plant-based diet. We're going to go into that, but also we're going to go into the state of our world. What's the state of our world health? And how is it a manifestation of what's going on within us? So we want to really just drop some thought-provoking questions. But before that, Simon, welcome to the show, man. Dr. G, thank it's, you. What a pleasure. What a pleasure. And yeah, I was. We were trying to like get this going a year ago. And f first of all, we were talking off air. Australia is crazy right now, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Everyone's on super lockdown. Yeah, there's been yeah lockdowns for the better part of a year. It's varied state by state, of course. And I, I grew up in Melbourne and now I live in Sydney, mm -hmm. but I have a lot of friends in Melbourne and they've certainly, I guess, experienced the, the harshest lockdowns. And I'll leave the debate as to whether the lockdowns are good or not uh, to someone else. But regardless, uh, of course, long lockdowns lead to frustration and uh, declines in mental health. So I do think the country is feeling it. And, you know, hopefully in the next couple of months, they come out the other side. Mm -hmm. To me, I always think about how we are being restricted from our very nature of mm. being tribal and communal. Mm -hmm. And we're already separate from each other. You know, we live in high rises. We don't even know our neighbor. But now we're forced to be separate from each other. When you were there, did you find the energy was changing? Did you find that people were sort of going to the brim on their mental health? Were, were you finding people were really affected, your friends, your family? I think so. But I also think it was a, it's, it's been a bit of a mirror and a wake up for people to realize how important their social connections are. And, and perhaps I'm hopeful from an optimistic point of view that it is helping people see that we shouldn't take these connections for granted. Mm -hmm. And so there's been an increased effort to reach out to people and check on our brothers and sisters. Right. And so, you know, times have been tough, but I'm hoping that, you know, that learning in and of itself is a bit of a blessing in disguise. Mm -hmm. So, so now that we have the state of Australia and mm -hmm. we, we know, I mean, a lot of us have been hearing it already. Mm -hmm. And I have some friends out there who I, I heard it, it became very difficult. Um, I saw it on the news last night yeah. and it was some, some rioting in Melbourne. And of course it, you know, it, it paints Australia out to, to be this, you know, place where horrific things are happening right now. And it's a very disgruntled population. And that kind of saddens me because Australia has always had, in my eyes anyway, a great reputation, mm -hmm. uh, for being this, you know, really free country, beautiful country, and people have loved coming and visiting. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a bit of an aspirational, I guess, element to Australia. Um, and, and I'm hopeful that, you know, the world sort of looks at that and just sees that, you know, rather than judging the people that are, are rioting, try to understand, you know, I mm. think there's a lot of judgment in this world and we can probably all benefit from, from refraining to judge and, and trying to understand what that person has endured. 
Right. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's sad for me to see it on the news. Um, and particularly Melbourne, where I grew up, it seems like the, the, the most livable city in the world, Melbourne was right. Voted I remember once. that. And it seems to have done a full 180. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic though. I think things will turn around. Mm -hmm. It's it's just just here, and I, I guess what you're saying a lot of is compassion, and we can mm. use more compassion in this world. And a lot of us have, we're all compassionate. A lot of us just have dull that, mm. but really being able to stop and go, all right, I can lead with judgment or I can lead with compassion. Mm. And a lot of us do lead with judgment, right, based on our own particular lens that we're looking at life from. But if we can lead with compassion, then we see things for what they are, and we mm -hmm. go, okay, you know, you know what? There's more to this story than what I'm just seeing the manifestation. Mm. And that's for me has been a powerful practice over the past few years. But totally. But I love that you you mentioned that that we can watch the news and see that. Mm. Yeah. Well, my first reaction when I watched it is, oh, idiots! Right. You're you're going to prolong the lockdowns. But then I I stop and pause and think, well, hang on, I'm I'm not in their shoes. What what are their experiences? And 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 can I? Can I actually better understand this situation by trying to listen to them? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And everyone wants to just be heard or seen, mm -hmm. right? That's the reason we we open up and show ourselves those versions of ourselves. So switching gears, you have a fantastic podcast. Thank you. A lot of people learning so much from it. The thing that I've always admired is that you refuse to be dogmatic, uh, but you are more in the empowering role, which is mm -hmm. the absolute role that I take. Mm -hmm. Let, let's just be open that people will make choices, but with the information that you're giving on eating a whole food plant-based diet, mm -hmm. you're empowering people to make that decision. You go here, it's in front of you, all this information, now choose mm -hmm. accordingly. Um, I'm interested to know though, what led you here? Were you always a plant-based whole food diet eater? We're like, what were, you know, you're very fit. So I'm assuming that you've always been into your health, mm -hmm. but what, what did that look like over time? Haven't always been a whole food plant okay. based eater. Uh, steak was a big part of my dietary protocol for a while there, particularly in my early twenties. Um, but I guess I've always been very curious about science ever since I was three or four years old. And my my dad, he's a, a professor. He's published hundreds and hundreds of papers. You know, works in a lab, has his own team. You know, one of the professors that walks around in a white coat and microscopes everywhere looking at at what's happening you know in in microscopic detail mm -hmm. <laughs> zooming right in you know mechanism level deep deep science very important science but i guess a little different to what i look at today which is more the human health outcomes mm -hmm. um but i would you know hop into dad's car as a little kid uh or come home and everywhere I looked, there was just stacks and stacks of printed out clinical studies mm -hmm. and they were all highlighted. And, you know, at the, when I was that old, I really, I didn't have a deep understanding of what any of that said, but I just had this appreciation for how we can use science to better understand the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in talking to my dad, it was, it was really clear that we could, we could use science to sort of test our intuition. And our hypotheses and move closer to to truth and when we can do that we can then produce really good information in an objective manner which we can use to better our lives mm -hmm. and, and our experience right. um and i thought that was really cool so a few uh years after that i was 15 years old actually at this time this is kind of when a little seed was planted uh for you know, the career that I would go on to kind of pursue. And we were living in Melbourne at this time. And uh, on the weekends, my dad and my brother and I would go out and spend, you know, the Saturday or Sunday out in the the wine district. And the this area is called the Yarra Valley. Mm -hmm. They do some some world-renowned wines. And it wasn't about the alcohol. You know, I was 15 right. and my brother was a few years older than me. It was about spending time with that and, you know, Rolling Hills. He had an MGB convertible, mm -hmm. you know, we'd be blasting Rolling Stones and U2 and Cat Stevens. And uh, I think, you know, people listening probably, hopefully, uh, you know, can relate to that. It might have been with their mom or their dad or a friend or an uncle, but those fond memories that you look back on. 
um, you know, where you were just having a great time and, and experiencing life and, and learning from someone. Mm -hmm. And on this particular day, it was just dad and I, we, we'd been out, had a fantastic day together. And on the way home, I could see that he was in some discomfort and I inquired and he said he was experiencing some chest pain and he, he downplayed it and we, we got home and, uh, I think males in particular have a tendency to do that, to right. ignore health, ignore right. symptoms. Right. And, uh, I've since come to learn that, that my dad was doing that for, for a number of years, mm. um, you know, and, and, and wasn't going and seeing a doctor that regularly, for example. Uh, and we got home and we were cooking dinner and I checked in with dad and he said, you know, everything seemed okay. And I headed off to bed after dinner thinking that it was. And I heard some noises uh, a little while later, maybe an hour or so after I'd gone to bed. And I, in the back of my mind, I was remembering, you know, what he had uh, been experiencing in the car. And so I went out to check. And by this stage, I could, I could see in his eyes, fear had set in, mm. you know, and it was like, this is like the first time that I'd ever seen my dad, my hero, right? you know, just like filled with fear and, you know, he couldn't deny it anymore. He was pale. He was out of breath. He looked scared mm. and he was actually, he'd, he'd already got the phone and had called triple zero, which is the Aussie version of 911 and uh, a bit easier, one button. Right. <laughs> yeah. More efficient. Yeah. More efficient. And uh, um, they, he, they asked him, is there someone else there that can help describe what's happening? And so that was me. I was the only one there with him. And uh, frightened as anything, I was speaking to the lady on the other end of the phone and was describing what was happening. And they said, well, based on where you're located, we were, because dad had a house at that period out in the country. It was a long way away from Melbourne, the city, and a beautiful property right in the country. But if you need, if you need to get to hospital quick, it's a problem. Right. And so they said, look, have you got somewhere that we can land a helicopter? And fortunately, you know, it was a heavily treed area, but there was out the back, there was a, an area that had been cleared for, for a lawn and it was enough space to get a helicopter in. And so I said, I, th I, th I think so. I think out the back, there's a big area of grass. You should be able to land there. And so they came, they, before I knew it, they were there. They rushed out of this helicopter, uh, came in with a stretcher and scooped him up off the floor and like put him, put him on oxygen, heart rate monitor, checking his vital signs. And they said, look, we need to get him to the hospital ASAP. Uh, I couldn't fit in the, in the helicopter. There wasn't enough room. So they said, there's an ambulance coming by road. You can trail. And so they were really good. They were looking after me and, you know, trying to help everyone stay calm. Uh, and I'm super grateful. I mean, you know, to have access to that is just privilege by definition. Um, not everyone does. Right. And so I trailed and I called my mom and brother who were in the city and said to them, you know, you should probably come out to the hospital. This is what's happening. Um, and my dad at this stage was, he was 41, you know, he was young. So young. And uh, he was not taking any sort of antihypertensives or statins or, you know, he he had no, no diagnosis or clinical diagnosis at least. Um, so for all intents and purposes, my dad was, you know, just representative of a young Australian dad. You know, living the standard Australian lifestyle, which is, you know, eating the standard diet. And he would still go to the gym sort of three, four times a week. And he's not, you wouldn't look at him at that stage and say he's an athlete, but he wasn't like morbidly obese or, or completely unfit, you know. So you, you would look at him and think, you know, he's not going to have a health issue at the moment. Mm. And so it came out of the blue and we got to the hospital and we waited and we waited and we waited and the doctor came out and he he said, look, we've saved your dad's life. And like, you know, that's all we're concerned about right then and there. Not why it happened or is it going to happen again. It's like that was the number one, you know, priority. So we were super, super elated with that. And, um, you know, 
they they usually or well, they did in this case, and I think they still do a bit of like a family meeting, but it can be the next day once the patient has stabilized and it's a bit more of an appropriate time to have mm. discussion. So we went back the next day and the cardiologist spoke with us. So my dad had had a severe heart attack and um, they said, look, we've taken your dad's history and my grandfather, so my dad's dad, had also had a heart attack. His was in his 60s. And uh, his mother had vascular dementia. So they, they said to my brother and I, I was 15, my brother's about 17, 18. They said, you know, based on your family history and the fact that cardiovascular disease runs in families, you guys need to get screened as you get older. And like, you know, like that's not bad advice, but I kind of wish the conversation went, was a bit broader and we could talk about all the things that contribute to cardiovascular disease because the feeling that I walked away with and my brother did for many years was one of disempowerment. Yeah. You know, this is written into our DNA. Right. 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 This is, we've got a, you know, a loaded gun here. Uh, we've been dealt bad genes. And so uh, we kind of just proceeded living the, the lifestyle that we were, that we knew, that everyone was living. Uh, and when I was in my mid twenties, you know, so 10 years later or so, uh, now forgive me, this is a long story that I, I realize I've, uh, this no, is no, go not on. a short answer. No, 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 this is great. <laughs> no, it's great. Uh, so you can let me know when you want to no. change topic. Uh, my brother called me and said, Hey, he was coming up to spend two weeks with with, with me, him and, him and his fiance, now his wife. And he said, he just wanted to give me the heads up. He said, we've changed the way we're eating. And I said, okay, interesting. I've always been quite open-minded and, and not one to judge what someone else is doing. That's for them to work out. And But he was coming to stay with me, so he wanted to give me a heads up in terms of grocery shopping and also if I'm booking restaurants. And I said, okay, so how have you changed your diet? And he said, well, we've we've removed red meat and poultry, and we're essentially we're just eat, we're eating a, a plant based diet with some fish. And I thought, okay, cool. Well, I can work with that. I liked seafood, mm -hmm. and really, that just meant not buying red meat or chicken. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty easy, right? And then a week before he's he's coming up, he calls me up again, and he says, "Hey, just want to let you know, we're not eating fish anymore." Mm. in a week no this was so this was a couple months before he called me up about the first change right. and then a week before he was coming up oh i see he I said i yeah. just want to let you know yeah. we decided not to eat fish anymore and i thought what the hell are we going to eat yeah. that's that's where my mindset was at at that stage of my life mm -hmm. you know i was my first degree was physiotherapy and at that stage then i was working with professional athletes i was in gym culture I was conditioned by the whole fitness culture, 100%. more animal protein, the better. Yeah. So this was all very foreign to me. And, and it was really challenging uh, the way that I saw healthy nutrition and just the way that I saw life in general. And so uh, I said to him, you know, that's fine. Uh, I might need a little bit more help with the grocery shopping. <laughs> and uh, I did know that, that Lauren in particular is a great cook. So I knew that they would cook a lot of food and they also did some research on restaurants. I had no idea where to go for 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 vegan food. You know, I, I'd never really considered that. <laughs> and so they came up and not once did they try and convince me to think about how I was eating. Um, we had a fantastic two weeks together. They cooked amazing food. It tasted just absolutely delicious. We went out to some restaurants that I'd never been to. I was exposed to all these new flavors and foods. And, you know, I was really, I was left. The one thing they did say to me when I was asking why they were making the changes was my brother had come across some information that there was populations who seemed to have much lower risk of cardiovascular disease who were adopting a more plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. That was all he said to me. He's not a nutritionist or, you know, science background or anything. And so at the end of that, that time with them, I was left with this experience of, well, okay, eating these foods doesn't mean I need to give up the joy for food. You know, I don't, I don't have to sacrifice anything. 
but I wanted to understand the science. So it was enough for me to go, well, if, if this is true, if there is science supporting this pattern of eating for a reduction in cardiovascular disease, given my dad's history, this is something I should look into. So it was really initially a, a sort of personal uh, quest to, to, to look into the science. And, you know, what did I do? First, I, I just started, you know, reading online and my undergraduate degree, I did an honors and, and had to conduct my own study and write a thesis. So I had some ability to read science at that mm-hmm. stage, mm-hmm. but I, you know, I was nowhere near skilled enough to make sense of all of the nutrition science information. Right. And I quickly saw how confusing it was. There's yeah. polarizing opinions. <laughs> and so I was left in this sort of state of feeling bamboozled by all of the information yeah. and it was conflicting. And so with my curiosity and sort of passion for science, I thought, well, I'm, I'm so inspired to go back and do a master's in nutrition science and get the skills so that I can actually decode this information. Yeah. What's going on here? Yeah. And the more and more I was doing that, the more and more it was becoming obvious to me that, you know, we, we like in society to have these little buckets and labels, you know, you've got vegan, you've got paleo, you've got keto and, you know, science doesn't particularly care about the labels that we come up with. And, I could I could see that there is a clear set of characteristics that define a healthy diet. These are diets that are low in saturated fat, they're you know low or devoid in trans fats, they have a good amount of unsaturated fats, they're rich in fiber, and they tend to have a predominance of plant protein over animal protein. And you know that could be a very thoughtfully constructed Mediterranean diet. It could be a pescatarian diet. It could be a vegetarian diet done well. It could be a vegan diet done well. Um, and so, you know, discovering that that theme and that set of characteristics, and looking at all of these polarizing, very conflicting ideas, and how confused everyone was, you know, I then was inspired to to start working out how to communicate this. And as you said at the start, ultimate goal being how to give people objective information, mm-hmm. not tell them what to do. And with that objective information that they can grab a hold of, then empower them to make the changes that feel right for them based on, you know, whatever level of commitment they're looking for. Mm-hmm. What a story. What a story, man. It's because it's it's it what a blessing that your family history has left you with because that was a driving force to do the research because Mm -hmm. you said, well, I'm genetically doomed, which now you know you're not. And then what a blessing your brother deciding at whatever given point, however that started, whether he saw it on on our news article Mm -hmm. or saw it on the news, that gift to your brother, which translated to you. I mean, this Mm -hmm. was just like a line of gifts that led you now to gift others with this information. And one thing you said very powerful is that there is a commonality between all diets, Mm -hmm. right? And that's when we talk about off air, what I admire within you is not being dogmatic because understanding that people will choose Mm -hmm. based on a few things, but you're telling us the very things that are common in all the research. Now, I wanna get into those things. We, you mentioned fiber Mm -hmm. and um, I know, I know you know Dr. Will Mm -hmm. and and I do too, and I'm still waiting to get him on the show, Bolsowitz, he's fantastic. Mm He's, he's incredible. Incredible. But fiber is something that I talk about so much. Mm-hmm. It is such an important nutrient. We're so devoid of fiber. Mm-hmm. In all of the research that you've done, how important is that nutrient as a whole? It's critical. You know, the 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 average person, I think in this country, it's it's around 15 grams a day, maybe even a touch less. In Australia, it's around 18 grams a day. And if you look at recommendations, they tend to be at sort of, you know, in Australia, it's 25 to 30 grams, but really that's just for regular bowel movements. If, it, if you're looking at recommendations for uh, chronic disease reduction of risk, it's, it's up more around the 35 grams of fiber per day, at least. Um, this is a huge blind spot. You know, if, if you were to say to me, what's one thing that people can focus on or, or the American and the Australian public at large can focus on to really just straighten up their diet? It's get 35 grams of fiber a day. And not everyone can do that overnight. 
you know, if you up your fiber and you've been on a 12, 10 gram fiber diet, right. it's like throwing an atomic bomb in there. Yeah. <laughs> and you feel it. So, you know, you, you, you have to, to take it slow and, and, and progress. Um, there was a recent study just out of Stanford university that I thought was really interesting. Professor Christopher Gardner, he's like my idol when it comes to setting up nutrition science studies, because, you know, unlike many studies where you you compare two diets and you've got your diet of interest and a control diet. A lot of the studies have a really bad control diet. Yeah. So it's set up from the start for success. Any diet, right? whatever it is outside of that. Yeah. yeah. And and what he does though is he 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 uh, always makes sure that the two diet arms are both high quality diets. So no matter what he's comparing, whether it's low carb with high carb, it's not it's not have one of those diets as a crummy diet set up to fail. Um, now, I digress. That's why I like him, but this study was different. This study was on on fiber and fermented foods, right? Really interesting study because they, they discovered some incredible information about uh, how food affects our immune system and inflammation. And so they had, this was a 10-week study, and they looked at, it was a randomized controlled trial, and they had half the subjects take their fiber intake from 20 grams to 40 and then the other half added fermented foods to their diet. So no increase in fiber in the other group, just adding fermented foods like kefir and kraut and kimchi and, and all that stuff. And, and there was some, uh, some yogurt products as well. And what they found was fascinating. So they were measuring the diversity of microbes in the gut. We have around 38 trillion microbes in the uh, large intestine. And when these guys are well balanced and we're feeding them, they look after us. They reward us mm -hmm. with, with the production of metabolites like short chain fatty acids, um, which then help maintain a really healthy gut lining. You know, it, they reduce that uh, permeability and stop that flow of uh, inflammatory endotoxins into the blood, stuff that no doubt you've spoken about many times. Um, I'm preaching to the choir here. But what was fascinating was they, they also looked at inflammatory markers. And they didn't just look at one, two, three prostaglandins into leukin-6. They looked at 200-odd of these inflammatory proteins. So a very broad, sophisticated study to see how do these foods modulate the immune system and inflammation. And interestingly against their hypothesis and against really what I would have thought, I would have thought taking fiber from 20 to 40 grams would have increased diversity and would have decreased inflammatory proteins. On, on an aggregate, it didn't, but I'll come back to that. So on average, it didn't. Whereas in the fermented group, people that added the fermented foods across the board, they had a decrease in 19 of these inflammatory proteins. So it was showing their, their, their immune system was working better. They were less inflamed and they had an increase in their microbiome diversity, which is synonymous with a healthy microbiome, right? Now, so big tick for fermented foods in that study, and that's a reminder for all of us you know, whatever your dietary preference is, it could be if you if you consume dairy, then there are, you know, yogurts with live cultures, but you can get plant-based versions now with live cultures. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, foods like your kimchi and sauerkraut mm -hmm. and regularly including those within our diets. Um, now, the researchers went back and looked at that group that went from 20 to 40 grams of fiber because they were, they were a bit stumped as to why, you know, there is quite a bit of research that would – suggests that if you increase your, your fiber, you would be dialing down inflammation. Mm. And what they found was there was responders and non-responders. So even though the average was, was that there was no benefit, there were certain people that did benefit. And the people who consumed the extra fiber that did benefit had a reduction in inflammation. At baseline, they had a very nice, diverse microbiome, whereas the other ones didn't. So they had a, a, a weaker microbiome composition, mm -hmm. whether that was through years of excessive alcohol or antibiotic use, mm -hmm. you know, who knows? But we know that many people in society today that yeah. are suffering illness lack that diversity. And so this then really raises uh, an interesting question because what if people with a weaker microbial, 
uh, composition, microbial composition could benefit through the addition of fermented foods first mm -hmm. to improve their diversity and then up their fiber. fiber yeah. So they're going to test that in, in some future studies, but it, it has got me thinking because I always, you know, I, one question I get from people is, Hey, I'm trying to increase my fiber, but I'm not feeling so great. And, you know, something I, I always try and remind people is that, you know, the fiber and the fruits and the vegetables and, and all those foods that are rich in fiber, they are good for you. But what's happening is the bacteria, those microbes in your gut aren't set up right now to be able to process that much. So we have to work on that. Mm. Um, so I just thought that was a interesting study. Fantastic. Did you put it on your story at some point? I think recently? so. Okay. Yeah. It was you. So I went to uh, Erwin over here mm -hmm. and got me some fermented miso that day. And I started every morning taking mm -hmm. a tablespoon and then before lunch, taking a tablespoon and before bed. And as I'm upping my fiber... It was because of, I remember mm -hmm. now it was a study that you put on your story because I've been having fermented every single day. It's like my medicine. I'll take a mm -hmm. tablespoon, tablespoon, tablespoon. And then I feel that my gut's been getting a lot better. I am particular sensitive to tons of fiber, mm -hmm. right? I, I remember think a lot of people are. A lot of people are. And a lot of people, and because, you know, we're, like you said, 15 to 20 grams a day. Mm -hmm. And then they hear someone on Instagram say, you need 40 grams of fiber. Mm -hmm. They go, okay, next day, their body is not adjusting to it and, 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 they're becoming bloated, mm -hmm. they're getting heartburn. So I think it's a really interesting point you bring about getting on a protocol possibly of fermented foods mm -hmm. for, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks, mm -hmm. four weeks, building that diversity up like that and then introducing mm -hmm. it, which makes so much more sense. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for bringing that up, man. And I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about all the people who all the time go, Dr. G, what about protein? I know you mm -hmm. get that question a lot. I sure. know you've spoke about it ad nauseum, but mm -hmm. I just want to know anything that you've been, like what is your conclusion on okay. protein and plant-based sure. protein and everything? Let's we got to know, man. Let's do it. Let's, I, go, I see you got let's, go through, let's go through amount, yeah. quality, yeah. and where you can find it. Listen, I, I see you at the gym. There's no shortage yeah. of protein here. There's no shortage of protein. A, a lot of hey, our friends- When I was uh, tr transitioning or thinking about transitioning, right. so, so actually, you know, coming back to that story full circle, I, I was progressively challenged by the information I was reading. I didn't want to change my diet. I was, I was healthy. I felt healthy. I felt good. You know, I was, I was in this fitness culture. I had no health reason to change my diet. And I actually wanted to prove my brother wrong by looking at the science, if anything. And, and I loved going to steakhouses with all my friends. And even though I'd often feel very lethargic afterwards. Um, but one thing that, that was in the back of my mind was even if science said, hey, just eat kale and you live to 140, I wasn't prepared to do that. You know, I, I wanted to still be able to pursue my athletic endeavors and stay strong. So I had that question at the start, protein, like everyone does. And so I, I always remind myself of that because anyone who's new to this space, it's easy to go, oh, I've spoken about protein so much. Like, you know, we, we know it's not an issue, but I put myself back into their shoes and realize this is a valid question. A hundred percent. You know, this is yeah. it. This, this question comes up because of the way our society functions and the way we've been conditioned. Um, so I'm glad you asked it. I think firstly, let's look at the sort of uh, RDA or RDI in various countries. Mm -hmm call it a little, something a little different uh, for protein, which is the amount of protein that uh, is required to satisfy the requirements of 97% of the population. So this is, you know, this is already whatever that amount is, is going to be excess for a lot of people if you think about it on an average basis. Mm -hmm. um, so that is about 0.8, I think in this country, 0.83 grams per kilogram. And if you take the average person, that's about 50, 60, 65 grams of protein a day. Mm. So that's, you know, the basic level of protein just to survive and live, you know, a relatively sedentary lifestyle. Uh, and then if we look at studies, looking at vegetarian and vegan populations, they are consistently all getting above this. So that's the first thing to know. So if you look at, you know, even the Adventists who eat a very low protein diet, they're at like 75 grams a day. There was a new study out with a very healthy vegan cohort in Slo Slovenia, mm -hmm. very health conscious, whole food, and they're getting 97 grams of protein a day on average. So the amount is not an issue. 
uh, you're going to get protein from all the plant foods, but a lot of it will come through the legume food group. And that's going to be your, your beans or chickpeas, lentils, tofu, tempeh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the next question that often comes up is around bioavailability and absorption, right? Which again, is a, it's, it's a, it's a worthwhile conversation. Um, and if we were to look at science from like 10 or 15 years ago, there, there certainly was evidence to suggest quite a big difference between animal and pr plant protein bioavailability. Um, but I've gone back through all of this in detail, every study, and I really wanted to understand what was the methodology, what were they looking at? And the bulk of these studies were using rat or pig models because they're easier to study than humans in this manner. And uh, so firstly, you know, physiology is similar to humans, but not the same. Uh, but m most importantly is that the grains and the legumes in these studies were being fed raw. And that's a problem. If we want to really consider bioavailability, you know, we know that soaking and cooking, mm -hmm. be it grains or be it legumes, increases the nutrient availability in those foods, mm -hmm. you know, and it decreases anti-nutrients that are stopping absorption, right? That's why we wouldn't pick up a dried bean and eat it. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> You'd probably be a bit sick. Yeah. Um, and so in the last few years, there has been studies now with humans and looking at plant proteins properly prepared and the difference in bioavailability only seems to be a few percent. Now, granted, at the moment, they've probably only tested a handful, maybe 10 different types of plant protein and there are hundreds. So we still need more science, but it is there is suggestive evidence that the differences between animal and plant protein have been grossly overstated based on the research that I just spoke to. Um, and, you know, if you just go back to the RDA of 0.83, when those guidelines were set up, one of the questions was, should we have a different recommendation for vegetarians and vegans? And they decided, no, we shouldn't. They don't need to consume more protein because uh, they ran various studies. I won't go into the detail. They're called nitrogen balance studies. And they were able to determine that there is very little, if if any, perceivable difference in the absorption and utilization of protein from plant and animal source. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all bioavailability, right? But I think what what matters most to you and I is health outcomes. You know, we can talk about percentages all day, but uh, what happens long, from a long term health point of view, and also if we're in the gym lifting weights, you know, how does plant protein stack up against animal protein? Mm -hmm. And if you look consistently at the the research looking at plant protein versus animal protein from a cardiovascular disease point of view, type two diabetes, various types of cancer, even dementia, there are huge benefits up for grabs by swapping calories from animal protein for plant protein. So we know that plant protein is conducive to better health span and lifespan. That's very clear. Now, in the more performance setting, different story. We, we need to run studies that are looking at, you know, head to head, people consuming animal protein, people consuming plant protein, lifting weights, mm -hmm. what happens? Mm -hmm. um, and there was a, a nice study that came out 2021, so start of this year. Brazilian researchers. It's the first study that has ever looked at a completely vegan plant-based diet, not just supplementation with a plant-based protein, but the whole diet. There's been a lot of studies in the past that have looked at a soy uh, or a pea protein shake, but they're doing it on top of an omnivorous diet. Right. That's not telling us what we want to know here. And so these researchers looked at a uh, 12 week training program, if my memory serves me correct. They had two groups. One was omnivorous with whey protein. One was vegan with soy protein. They matched the total protein at one point, uh, just over 1.6 grams per kilo, which is a, uh, a high protein intake, but that's the level that has been shown within the science consistently. If you're someone that's in the gym and wanting to absolutely maximize muscle protein mm -hmm. synthesis, that's the level for you, right? So they match those two, but one group's getting it from a mix of plant and animal in the omnivorous group, and one's getting, getting it from all plant. They put them through uh, some resistance training, 
two full body workouts each week. And they were measuring, you know, not just muscle protein synthesis, which a lot of studies measure. That's that's a, a biomarker. Interesting. But what matters more is what happens to strength and what happens to lean muscle. That's what we want to know. That's that's the proper health outcomes to look at. And they, they saw over the course of this study, these are healthy adult males, there was zero difference between the two groups in strength or in lean muscle, right? So that's a brand new study that's out that shows that if total protein is matched, there doesn't seem to be a difference in terms of being able to, to grow muscle hypertrophy or to uh, improve strength. Now, I would be you know, fooling everyone if I was to say we can extrapolate that to all different populations, elderly, etc. There's more science to be done, um, but that's kind of where we stand. So to summarize all of that, the the vegetarian and vegan populations are all consuming above the recommended amounts of, of protein. The bioavailability has been overstated. There's still some more science to be done, but perhaps what matters most is that people eating more plant protein are at less risk of these chronic diseases. They are tending to live longer. And in the studies looking at strength training and the development of lean muscle hypertrophy, there doesn't seem to be a difference, at least a difference that science can can identify. Fantastic, man. Because that is the question that we get across the board. And every single person, even like my friends back home, mm-hmm. they'd be like, hey man, but what about protein, man? You're looking kind of skinny. I'm like, man, I've always been skinny. Like, you know, but but we mm-hmm. in our community know a lot of people, including yourself and our friends who have maximized their strength, mm-hmm. maximized lean muscle, and they don't eat any meat. So it's mm-hmm. it, one thing is always the bioavailability argument. They'll, so they'll say, okay, you eat that amount, but meat's always gonna be, or animal protein is always gonna be more bioavailable, bioavailable mm-hmm. into the body. But it's awesome to hear that um, because very encouraging because there's a lot of people listening they mm-hmm. go wow you know my trainer they said that i have to mm-hmm. incorporate this but awesome that you gave us the updated research mm-hmm. which i knew you would i knew you would but then the, but then a lot of people really the next part of it is they'll talk about like uh nutrients for the brain like choline mm-hmm. have you looked into anything mm-hmm. uh, updated on that really quickly just to mm-hmm. satisfy that choline for, yeah and dha yeah, is another exactly. one that comes up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so where I stand on choline is I, I don't think vegetarian and vegan populations need to supplement it. Uh, if you look, you know, depends on the study you look at, but most are getting sort of two, 300 milligrams a day. I do think in a prenatal, if you're pregnant, it's a good idea to supplement. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, you know, in Australia, the choline recommendation is it's an adequate intake level it's not an rdi Mm -hmm. and it's because they can't really identify how much we actually need and you know so i'd like to see some more science done looking into choline requirements in different uh you know age groups and different life stages but the studies that have looked at it you know there's one there's one main one and it compares 50 milligrams a day to 500 and nothing in between and then that was used to set the adequate intake level. Um, so, you know, I've I've read a lot of the the research on choline and spoken to a lot of experts, and I'm not of the belief that the everyday person needs to supplement with it. Mm. Um, you know, if it's in your multi and you're supplementing with a small amount, I don't see any problem with that either. Um, but one thing that that really makes me confident in that is that. If vegetarian and vegan populations were not getting enough choline, I would expect them, I would expect to see higher incidence of choline-related uh, deficiency disorders, mm-hmm. and we don't see that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I have my my suspicion is that people are already getting enough through their diet. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, they're eating a nice diverse diet, um, and then DHA. This is an interesting one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I personally supplement with an algae oil. Right. Um, which has a DHA and an EPA in it. But I do that as a bit of an insurance policy. I think from a, a brain health point of view, cognition, um, definitely there's good science showing if someone has mild cognitive impairment, 100%, two grams a day of DHA will improve their cognition. That's been reproduced in multiple studies, really high quality randomized controlled trials. We know that. But if you wait until someone has Alzheimer's dementia and you give them DHA, doesn't improve. Mm-hmm. So it's you have to intervene early in, in that circumstance. 
the question around should just healthy adults um, be supplementing with DHA for cognition, I, I don't believe there's strong evidence to show that that is superior to, say, a plant a whole food plant-based diet that has adequate amounts of omega-3s from walnuts and chia and flax. Um, you know, and there are varying opinions about out there about it. My position is that there it's not clear in the science, but if you can justify the cost of an algae oil, then I think it's a good insurance policy. Mm -hmm. And if you can't, you want to you want to make sure. And really, anyway, everyone should be doing this. You know, daily inclusion of be it walnuts or hemp seeds or chia seeds or, mm -hmm. or ground flax seeds, so that you are getting those plant-based omega-3s. Yeah. And, and again, that's that's a staple, right? Mm -hmm. You can add yeah. that in. It can be part of your breakfast. You Absolutely. can put it in a smoothie all yeah. in one shot. Yeah, you yeah. can eat it throughout the day. So that's amazing, amazing stuff. So for someone, what I find the biggest trouble is people who are switching to a whole food plant-based diet is that they do it incorrectly. Mm -hmm. And then they say they feel terrible and then they go, it didn't work for me and I'm going back to my diet. What are some staples that we can take? Just as like, these are the parameters that I need to remember when mm -hmm. I'm switching my diet. And then I can go from there based on like cool. what foods I like. Yeah. So, I mean, from a food group point of view, you've got fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds, right? Now, when people are moving from an animal-based diet to a plant-based, I think one of the most important principles to understand is calorie density. Key, right? And I made this mistake when I was transitioning. Plant-based foods and meals are a lot less calorie dense. So what that means is that in order to eat the same amount of calories, your plate is going to look a little fuller. And if it doesn't, if the plate looks just as full, it's likely to be less calories. And so uh, consistently feedback that I get, particularly from people with a very high caloric intake, they're very active, is that they feel like they're lacking energy or maybe they're losing some weight. Now that can be great for, for a certain person that wants to lose weight, but it's not so great if that's not your goal, right? Um, and in fact, that's one of the massive benefits of a plant-based diet in a, in a very obesogenic environment is that, that by default, it will lend itself to weight loss. Um, but if that's not your goal, you need to be conscious of caloric density and making sure that you are eating enough volume to satisfy your body's energy requirements. So that's a, that's a good principle. Now, in terms of specific foods, because you, you might be getting more to that, uh, what, what are the sort of superstars, I guess, that I like to think about? Um, I don't like to single out one single food as the superfood because a lot of this comes down to overall dietary pattern and consistency over time. But I'm, I'm a really big fan on the inclusion of berries. I think, you know, a couple of servings of berries a day. There's great research showing benefits of that for acutely for cognition and also for long-term. Um, I eat blueberries like they're going, <laughs> going out of season every yeah, day, yeah. Uh, super rich in anthocyanins. And, um, you know, they're, they, they are a superfood for the brain. Um, then dark leafy greens, you know, and, and I often forget these myself. Um, but your, you know, mustard greens or spinach or kale, all, all of those guys are super loaded in minerals, but also really rich in, in phytochemicals and, you know, these polyphenol compounds and um, carotenoids, et cetera, right? Um, and, and also rich in nitrates and, and nitrites. Mm -hmm. And not to be confused with those that are in animal foods, um, because the pathway in terms of how they're converted is different. People may hear nitrites and nitrates in animal foods and think, hang on, I've heard that those are possibly uh, carcinogenic. Yeah, like a hot dog. Right, like a hot dog, right? And it's confusing, right? Because hang on, they're in my broccoli. <laughs> like, how's, how's that working? Yeah. Like, broccoli is, you know, across the board, everyone would agree it's health promoting, but it contains nitrates. What's going on here? Well, uh, it all comes down to what those nitrates are packaged next to and therefore the pathway that they go down. Imagine two slides at a theme park, right? If those nitrates are sitting next to things like, um, you know, uh, 
poly, polycystic uh, hydrocarbons. Did I get that right? Poly, uh, uh, polycyclic aromatic po- hydrocarbons. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons yeah. or he- heterocyclic cyclic amines, amines uh-huh. right? It's a mouthful. Yeah, um, I just do the acronym. Uh, yeah, use the acronyms there. Um, but if they're sitting next to those guys, those guys will convert the nitrates into N-nitroso compounds, which are thought to be carcinogenic, mm-hmm. right? And that's one of the mechanisms thought to be why processed meats are associated with colorectal cancer. Right. Now, what happens though when you consume nitrates in vegetables is they're sitting next to antioxidants, right. vitamin C. Now, these guys send the nitrates down the other slide, mm-hmm. right? And and so as soon as you start chewing the dark leafy greens, and this is why you know, I often put dark leafy greens in my smoothie, but I do try to remind myself it's also good to chew them because we have microbes under our tongue that start this pathway and this conversion. And when you're chewing those dark leafy greens, it kickstarts the cascade where nitrates get converted into nitric oxide. And you will hurt. You will have heard of people, you know, taking beetroot supplements mm-hmm. and stuff, really potent for increasing nitric oxide levels. Dark leafy greens will do the same thing, and this, you know, vasodilates. It opens up. It's it's health promoting for our arteries, and so, um, you know, one of the best things that you can do is two, three times a day, make sure that you have a serving of dark leafy greens. Mm-hmm. So that's berries. Dark leafy greens. I also love, you know, broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower. These cruciferous vegetables, which are, you know, w- when prepared, and, and I think you've gone into this, you know, chopping them. Oh yeah, for and sure. Increasing for sure. the sulfur and seed content. Powder, and, putting them in yeah, there. so if you don't have time to do the chop and wait, cook them up, add mustard seed powder. You'll increase the sulfur mm-hmm. which is a a compound that's thought to be anti-carcinogenic, mm-hmm. you know, great stuff. And and so uh, cruciferous vegetables, dark leafy greens, berries, these, these guys are loaded with nutrition and these are activating these disease resistance pathways in our body. Um, so thinking about those and then when I'm constructing my – my meal, a lot of the calories are then coming from whole grains, be it, you know, brown rice or quinoa, the legumes, which I mentioned before, providing a lot of fiber and a lot of protein. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you can really up the calories should you wish to with nuts and seeds. Mm, Powerful. And that, and that's the guidebook right there. That's it. Because we, we get so lost. We just jump in and we go, we eat an impossible burger, right? Mm -hmm. And then we just eat all of these processed foods. It, it, however you cut it, the processed foods are always going to be not good for your mm-hmm. health. But what you described and what I hear as all of these plant-based whole foods is these foods are alive, mm-hmm. right? The ones that you bite into and your body goes, you like it's inflammation. Oh. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. it's reducing inflammation, feeding your heart, feeding your brain, feeding your arteries. I, I just love that. One of the things that I do actually before workouts is about two hours, I'll have like a beet salad, mm-hmm. right? If I'm in the rush, then I'll, mm-hmm. I'll make it into all a drill, like a smoothie yeah, yeah. or something. But um, it's so, so powerful. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, I spoke to the uh, Clippers team two years ago about reducing or removing milk and all of the things that come up better in athleticism. And it's crazy because it, they, their eyes were glazed over hearing like, what do you mean? This is, they have to have milk. They have to replace all these nutrients, right? Oh, calcium, bone, strength, mm-hmm. protein. I'm like, oh, saturated fat, inflammatory mm-hmm. proteins, antibiotics, right? And then we talked about all the other things and there was just seeing how in awe they were that no one ever told them this. Mm-hmm. And this is the information you're putting out. Um, I love that. You're passionate about the health of the world. You're passionate about the state of the world. You're passionate about how even just taking uh, uh, taking authority on our own health can change the health mm-hmm. of the world. What is what is your state? I mean, what is your view on the state of global health? How 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 does it look? And how does is, are you connecting the way that we eat to the state of it? It's just I want to switch gears on that because. Mm-hmm. It's just such an important topic, mm-hmm. right? Because we think about our health being like, I'm going to eat this, I'm going to work out, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to smoke, and there's health. But health is so much more than that because mm-hmm. we're interconnected. Yes. And, you know, I think the biggest chapter in my book was on this topic, and that's mm-hmm. how important it is. Uh, you know, as you pointed out, our health is inextricably tied to the planet's health. Instead of, instead of seeing nature as around us, we are nature. 
<laughs> it seems obvious, but it's easy to to think that we are we are separate to nature, right? right? And that's not true. Um, and if you read the IPCC's reports and and what the the work with the United Nations, it's very clear that we need to change the way we're living if we're going to curb climate change. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about cooling the planet. I'm talking about, you know, sending, putting a, pushing the brakes on biodiversity loss and this extinction of all of these animals and all of these plant species and cleaning up our rivers and reducing the pollution and getting, you know, life back into the oceans where there's dead zones and algal blooms and we're suffocating, you know, life through our actions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is not about judging people on the individual level because we are just part of a system. But part of changing that system is understanding how it's working. And if you, you know, if you look at greenhouse gas emissions as a whole, you know, it's clear we have to change the way we're producing energy first and foremost, 100%. You know, the, the energy uh, from, from industries Industries are responsible for around 75% of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but agriculture is responsible for around 25%. And as we start to move to clean energy over the next 10, 20 years, if we don't change agriculture, it will be the most significant contributor to greenhouse gases that exist on the planet. And we will not meet climate goals. If we don't address agriculture, we don't meet climate goals. So where are we going wrong with agriculture? Well, currently, we use about 50% of the habitable land across Earth for agriculture. Right? That's a lot of land. And of that, 83% of that, 80-83% of that is dedicated to animal agriculture which only produces 18% of calories. It's enormously inefficient. It's using up all of this space, you know, for be it for factory farms or grazing animals or growing, you know, all of the soy and all of the corn that is then fed into these systems. And, you know, these are, these are living animals that have a high metabolic rate. That's what we have to come to grips with, right? So every time we're extracting calories out of the land and feeding them to the animal that has a high metabolic burn, it's just burning energy to be alive. Mm. That We talk about food waste and you think about the food waste at home. This is the biggest source of food waste that exists today. You feed 100 calories into a cow, you get three out. This is, this is where we're going wrong. It's, it's a, the most inefficient way to produce calories. And so it's abundantly clear you know, through the, the, the scientific consensus that the only way out of this is to produce more calories from less land. We have to decrease the footprint of agriculture. And the only way we're going to get there is by more and more people eating more plant-based around the world, you know, particularly less meat and dairy, which are using up the most space. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we are seeing people turn this way and, and, you know, so I have real reason to be optimistic. Um, but then, you know, we also see what I call distractions, you know, and, uh, I've, I've had about six or seven people on my show now talking about regenerative agriculture and, you know, I'm, I'm all for regenerative practices. I think regeneration is, is, is the mindset that we need to have, not just sustainable. We need to regenerate life. Um, but I have become increasingly aware of, you know, beef, grass fed beef has been rebranded as regenerative beef. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there are a lot of wild claims being made that are not supported by the science, you know, and, uh, it, it frustrates me because I think at this very pivotal time in human history, we have to be guided by the best science. We don't have time to make mistakes here. And, uh, you know, you, there are a lot of claims in that, in that part of the world about that being a real solution to reversing climate change, mm -hmm. right? Um, but when you look at the peer-reviewed literature, and there's a great meta-analysis on this out of Oxford University, it's clear that those practices are still net carbon emitting. 
when you factor in the methane from the animals and the amount of carbon that's drawn down, it's still a net emitting practice. And over time, as the soil becomes more saturated in carbon, you, you can't just continue. It's not a linear curve. You can't just continue to draw down carbon. It becomes saturated. So over time, the practice is more net emitting because those animals are still emitting the same amount of methane. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I, what, where I'm conflicted is that, you know, that story of regenerative beef, I understand why it's a story that has had some success and because essentially it means we don't have to change the way we eat. We can just produce food differently and people that don't want to change their diet, that's a nice message, right? Mm -hmm. um, and also it's, it's a romantic story because, uh, you know, who doesn't want to see our, our farmers help heal the world, right. right? And I guess where I'm a little conflicted is around who are the right people who, who should be at the table? What voices are needed right now if we're talking about being better stewards of the land and being better guardians of the land? You know, if you, if you think deeply about that, and I'm going to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. What do you think the relationship is in this country between, uh, you know, descendants of settlers and Native Americans? Tumultuous. Yeah. And so... You know, I, I've thought very deeply about this and a lot of our problem, I described that food system. One of the main reasons we're here is through this mindset of domination. Right. We're dominating the land. And it just seems ironic to me that we're going to, to propose, you know, white man and his cattle you know, and I'm not saying that, that ranchers are bad people mm. because they're descendants, right? But we, we can't erase history, you know, and this is the same in Australia. If we're looking back two, 300 years ago, there was mass genocide. Yeah. There was mass culling of bisons. And so if we want to heal the land, I think we need to heal the fractured relationships mm -hmm. that exist with the very people who have the wisdom of regeneration. <laughs> It's so true. Right? Yeah. And if you look at regenerative practices, you know, we, we are seeing now this, this new brand of regenerative ag and the people within it will, and some people will, will refer back to the indigenous practices. So I'm not, I don't want to suggest this to everyone, but I think that it's, it's very frequently overlooked that, you know, intercropping or polycropping or cover cropping, all of these are Native American or indigenous uh, uh, practices from around the world. This isn't something new that science has just made up in the last 10 years that yeah. we can brand up and put into a documentary. This is deep, deep wisdom. And so, uh, you know, when I think about climate change in the food system, I see this as a bit of a mirror. It's, 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 it's reflecting the parts of our life that we need to address. Mm -hmm. And to to just continue going on and to dominate the land and erase history, my fear is that we we aren't getting to the core of the issue here. Mm -hmm. And so, look, I don't profess to have the answers there, but what I what I think is useful is for everyone to think about that and to maybe ask themselves the question: how much they know about that history, and how can we amplify the voices of people that of 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 uh first nation people mm -hmm. who who do have that wisdom and do know how to be the guardians you know we look at land as owners let's flip that instead of being owners why aren't we stewards why aren't we guardians of the land why aren't we protecting the land to make sure that we're protecting our species other species and protecting this place for future generations of humans mm. Man, I, I felt that in my soul. And that is the truth of the truth, man, because, you know, it's, it's, it's funny that you say it right now, all of this, because uh, this weekend I did a sound ceremony and part of the sound ceremony was uh, talking, there was a, a, a fable of three seeds that were given to early on before humanity, you know, in the spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. And as we manifested in humanity, those seeds came through different ways of 
reclaiming our truth, right? And we talked about separatism and being one. Mm -hmm. um, the illusion of separation, we're pushing to the max and we're sort of getting there. We couldn't feel more separate mm -hmm. from each other and the world and the land. But those three routes were taken through stories that have been given over over time and kept and, and protected over time. Written word, right? That have been protected over time. And the third seed was the indigenous. And the the power that they were given was when the time is right for us to remember how to come back, we look at them to remember, right? We look at them to remember how to live in community. Mm -hmm. We look at them on how to treat our land. We look at them on how to have a relationship with the species around us, right? And not only things seen, but all things unseen, right? The spiritual realm, whatever it may be, the power that the indigenous cultures have are that when the time is right, that's going to be where we look. And that's the most powerful thing I heard. And then you saying that, I was like, this is this is something more. Something's lighting up within me. So um, I love that you said that. You know, we could talk on and on. And I know it sounds to me you ain't going back to Australia anytime soon. So maybe we'll have you back on while you're here. Um, but I appreciate this convo so much. And it really like... We covered a lot, man. We you did. set the precedent on on your story. You set the precedent on on just how to how to really switch to a plant based diet. Man, we talked about protein. We talked about fiber. The things that we all want to talk about, choline, and then we really talked about the deep stuff and and how to heal the world. Uh, what's the name of the book? So everyone knows. The book is the proof is in the plants, mm -hmm. and you know, I think we discussed this, but it's not about telling people how to eat. It's it's an objective look at the information and, you know, choose your own adventure. Pick the information that feels right for you to act on. And, you know, I wish you all the best. I love that, man. And your podcast, what's the name of it? Podcast is Plant Proof. And how do we find you? Uh, at plant underscore proof. Everybody go follow. Everybody go buy the book. Everybody go listen to the podcast. It's powerful stuff. Thank you for coming on, my man. Dr. J, love you, brother. Mm -hmm.